Hello, everybody. My name is Daniel Getzel, and I am one of the program directors for the NSF Engines program. We are excited to have you here for our first road show. We're going to have individuals from 10 states uh, joining us for this discussion. It should be a fantastic over quick overview of the program. Then you'll have an opportunity to hear from uh, a couple of our awardees from round one, which we're really excited about um, in a fireside chat format. So just before we get started, a couple of key dates. Uh, letters of intent are due on June 18th. August 6th is one preliminary proposal they're due and full proposals, which are invitation only, are due on February 11th, 2025. Um, let's get started. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the format. Um, the event officially runs from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern. I am going to do a very brief overview of the engines program. If you want a more comprehensive overview, highly recommend watching the webinar that we've posted online which is a very deep dive into the program and all the intricacies around applying. Um, after that, we'll have a fireside chat with two members of a leadership team from our awarded engines from cohort number one. You'll hear from teams from North Carolina and New York. Uh, then we'll have breakout rooms. They'll run from about 2.55 to 3.30. If you joined us um, during our first round of this, there's some similarities, but also some new wrinkles to the breakout rooms. I will share with you the details on that. Um, and then if you want to keep going, you're having great conversations, we're not going to stop you. You'll be able to stay in the breakout rooms um, all the way up to 4 p.m. So the goals of these roadshows are slightly different than perhaps some other events you've come to from NSF. First of all, we really want to give our applicants an opportunity to learn and hear from our current award recipients. We want to give you an opportunity to meet each other. There might be people in the room you might not already know. Some of you might already have your team and you're ready to apply. Others might be looking for a team. Others might have a team, but have specific gaps, and you need to fill those gaps. The goal of these events is really to help facilitate those introductions and that collaboration. We want to avoid regions going at it alone. You'll see that we published some data. We shared that in the last email that you got talking about some of the people in the room, and we'll share some more data over the presentation today that will hopefully help you um, learn more about what's going on in your region and where opportunities might exist. And then the last thing is, for those of you who already opted in, um, you'll have the opportunity to get the contact information of other attendees so that you can reach out to each other and continue the conversation. Today is just a jump off point. Hopefully there's ongoing conversations already happening in the region and there'll be new conversations that come out of the discussion. So who's in attendance today? We're really intentional about wanting to build these roadshows and these rooms to be representative of all the different types of stakeholders we want to see on an engine application. So you'll see leadership from university, you'll see researchers, You'll see individuals from corporates, local electeds, um, economic development leaders, you know, individuals, um, workforce groups, nonprofits, incubators, and accelerators. This is kind of a mix of the folks that we hope to see in our future applications. So we wanted to make sure we built that type of room here. So you might have noticed even when we asked you to sign up, you know, we asked, who else can you bring along? Are there people from different sectors who you can bring into the room? Because that's a critical part of our theory for how you build a collaborative, meaningful NSF engine. So now I'm going to give a really brief overview of the program, and then I'll turn it over to Kimberly, another one of our program directors for the fireside chat. Uh, so we have a funding opportunity on the street right now. Uh, the first deadline is June 18th. If you're interested in being a lead organization, um, you will need to submit a one page letter of intent by June 18th. And then there will not be any down select meaningful that occurs after that, but there'll be an opportunity then kind of your ticket to submit a full pre a preliminary proposal in August. So the goal of this program is to really build and expand the geography of innovation. We want each of these engines to be a center for R&D and technology development around a topic area. And we think it's critically important that you're building cross-sector coalitions to do this work. An engine must work together as a network of partners and community stakeholders to build its region into a national leading ecosystem. We want to create new growth opportunities in the region with a focus on undertap untapped populations and underserved communities. And we have a particular focus on funding for regions that have not fully participated in the tech boom of the past. So we think about those as slightly less established innovation ecosystems. So what's involved in building an engine? We think about it in three different parts. You need a coalition, and these are kind of unique in that they're led by a full-time CEO. There needs to be a shared purpose. How, what is everyone working towards across the region to drive a nation leading inclusive technology driven ecosystem. And what's the impact? It is not just enough to do research. How is this going to lead to new job opportunities, translational outcomes, 
and all that work that's required to build an economic development strategy and implement it within your region. So as a lot of you know, we made 10 awards earlier this year. Um, they span 18 states. Um, it was a $150 million investment with $15 million going to each awardee with the opportunity for them to get up to $1.6 billion. Our um, dollars into these awards are actually matched in a meaningful way from uh, private sector, state and local, you know, almost at a two to one level. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the importance of sustainable capital stacks and sustainability models. Um, and this was really, really exciting. We viewed this as one of the largest investments in place-based science and technology R&D in the history of our nation. And this was a new space for NSF to move into, and we're still learning. And a lot of those learnings are reflected in this new solicitation that we put out. Um, a couple of things, you know, we also had 58 development awards in addition to our 10 NSF engine awards. Um, you know, we have significant match from the private sector. Something that might be interesting for some of you who are newer to NSF, about 40% of our lead organizations were first time NSF award recipients. So there's no need that you have been getting NSF awards for years and decades in order to lead these applications. We're actually encouraging new organizations to come into the mix. And we had over 450 organizations partnering with our awardees. So some of them were providing capital, some of them were receiving funds. They were involved in a number of different shapes and forms, but the key to this is partnership was central to our work. So this is kind of a map of where our first round of the 10 awardees were. Um, here's kind of a, another quick overview on the deadlines. I know we're, we're hitting you with that repeatedly because it's so important um, to keep those in mind. Um, in order to submit a letter of intent, you do need a UEI. So if you are thinking about that, there's some free work that you get started on now. Um, you know, a couple of things, I won't go into see much detail on this. I'd recommend you watch our webinar to go deeper, but there's, we really think it's important to build a foundation and make some strategic decisions early around that your topic area, your region of service, your strategic plan, and who should lead this? Uh, what's the best organization to do the leading work and what other organizations need to come in around this coalition? And then once you make some of those key strategic decisions, you need to think about the team. You know, who are the core partners? Um, who's the CEO? You don't need a CEO at the time of your preliminary proposal, but within six months of your award, you will have to have a full-time CEO. You can have kind of a PI who's serving this role in an interim capacity. And then we think a lot about the core partners who are a part of this coalition and the governance board that will help you make these key decisions. Um, I'm not going to go through every single one of these key programmatic changes. I'm going to just hit a couple. Uh, we're not doing development awards this time around. For those of you who are familiar, development awards were a million dollar awards for slightly earlier ecosystems. We're now saying everybody is in the pool for this larger $160 million opportunity. Uh, tribal nations and state and local governments can lead an engine. Uh, we're limiting applications, only one submission per organization. Uh, last time around, we did concept outlines and then full proposals for 30 page proposals. This time around, we're tweaking it a little bit and it's letters of intent which are just one page of documents, not going to have a down select base on that, and then preliminary proposals. And out of the preliminary proposals, a subset of them will be invited to submit a full proposal um, early 2025. There's a heavy emphasis this time around on reaching untapped communities and populations and showing evidence of inclusive stakeholder alignment um, throughout this process. Um, we were also asking for some more detail around your level of commitments. So you know, at the pre-proposal stage, we're going to ask for a letter of commitment from a senior official within your organization. Also, you have an opportunity to bring in letters of collaboration from a couple of key stakeholders, and you'll have to really explain what they're bringing to the table and why they care about this opportunity. And then we're also for asking for dollar figure estimates required for commitments from core partners, regional stakeholders, and others. Uh, with that, I am going to turn things over to Kimberly, who can introduce our fireside chat. I think we have two great speakers here today. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and I hope Kimberly, Pear, and Melissa can come up on stage. Okay, great. Daniel, can you mention the Q&A, please? Uh, yes. One other thing to mention is if you have questions for our speaker, please use the Q&A, and we'll try to answer a couple of them during this conversation. Great. Thank you. So it's a huge pleasure of mine to welcome our two guests today to our fireside chat. We have Per Stromhog here from the Upstate New York Energy Storage Engine, and Melissa Sharp from the North Carolina Textile Innovation and Sustainability Engine. And as uh, Daniel was just saying, 
The goal here is to have a conversation with our guests about their successful proposals um, to be part of the first cohort of NSF Engine Award recipients. So I have some questions that I'm gonna start us off with. And we would love um, as the conversation moves forward um, for our participants here today, those of you live on the call to use the Q&A function um, to give us some more questions that we can ask. Um, we're going to be here until about um, 2.55 p.m. Eastern, so we have about 40 minutes to chat, and then we're going to go into the breakout rooms. Um, so if you're just arriving, uh, take a look at the information that's in our chat about um, what we're up to, and I am going to start with the first questions. So, um, Pear, let's start with you, and then Melissa will have you answer the same question. So. Can you tell everyone how you got involved with an NSF engine proposal and what first steps your team made to start building the coalition that came together for your successful proposal? Oh, you're muted. No? <laughs> All right, we're gonna work on that. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah. There we go. Perfect. Great, thank you. Yeah. Uh, great question. So um, in our case, it goes back a little bit before the engines because we also uh, uh, put together a coalition for the Build Back Better Regional Challenge, uh, which it also is a place-based economic development initiative, but with a very, very different focus, I would say, than what the engine has. So we kind of had a start on a coalition for that purpose. Uh, when the engine came out, we looked at that and said, you know, the engine is a very, very different program. We need to align exactly with what NSF is asking for. Uh, so we started with the core of what we had with two core partners that was part of our existing coalition. And I hope you all already are working with partners that you have a good relationship with. So you have that core to start with. And then literally just analyzed throughout what we thought could be this region to see who needs to be at the table for something like this, because you want to have representation, you have to have a geographic representation, you want to uh, have representation from the different assets that will bring value to the coalition or to the program. So we spent a lot of time actually thinking through that very, very thoroughly, because you want to have a coalition that uh, can work really well together. Uh, at the same time, it can't be, you want to have inclusivity as much as possible, but you want it's difficult if the coalition gets too large too to manage. So how do you balance to have really covering everything you feel you have to be covered in what you need to do? At the same time, thinking about how you're actually going to manage and govern this so that it doesn't go out of proportion or gets gets too large. So um, I think the lucky thing we had or the good thing we had was that everyone we asked to become a member of the coalition, we never had anyone say that, no, we don't want to, be or no, we want to take over and lead this. I mean, everything I think went very, very smoothly. We had a very good relationship from the start and everyone jumped on board very quickly. So we didn't have that uh, sort of lingering, you know, are you in, are you out? Or, you know, can you make sure that this is really going to work or not? So I think in our case, that was almost part of one of the most fun parts of the process, I think, is actually building a coalition, right? Because you build something for the future and thinking about, hey, wouldn't it be awesome to work with these other people at this organization and they have things to bring to the table that I don't have or we don't have and together we can make something which is so much bigger and better. Fantastic. That's such a great start for us. So Melissa, do you want to add to what Pear has to say? Do we need to unmute you? I'm not sure. There we okay. go. Okay. There you are. Great. Yeah, I mean, I would echo a lot of what Pear said, um, that there is a lot of careful thought that has to go into how you build your coalition. For us, um, we didn't have, uh, we had come together to write a couple of proposals as a core group. Um, build Back Better was one and looking, and we'd also talk, discuss going after potentially an EDA tech hub. Um, and so, we, you know, and all of us work in the textile sector and can work with a lot of the same clients and companies and collaborate on projects. So we sort of had this, loose organization of partnerships and arrangements to all work together. Uh, so this is a fantastic opportunity for us to formalize the way that we were working together and bring to this team more tightly together to go after these the specific initiatives that our engine addresses. 
Um, and we, as a coalition, decided to select our lead institution as a, a rural focused group to help address the um, specific asks of the engine proposal around the place based um, investments and um, really to bring that focus of, of uh, deepening the impact in those rural communities and counties where our region of service is. And so that was really important for us, I think, to center around a 501c3 organization because that's what made the most sense for our topic area and our region of service, um, rather than being led by like NC State, for example, that's located in Raleigh, North Carolina, and to really have the seat of our engine focused in in the counties where we really wanted to have the most impact. Um, and that being said, I think, you know, the the length of time that we've all worked together, the ways in which we've worked together really contributed to our, our core coalition coming together really quickly um, per Pairs Point. It's nice when people are excited to work together and already have a history of trust in working together. It's a long process to put the proposal together, and I think having that history uh, really helped us work through the process as well with NSF. Great, and I'm actually going to follow up on the first question, mm -hmm. asking a couple of details. So um, maybe we'll start with Melissa. You're you're ready to go already off mute. So can you talk about some activities that you did that helped to build these relationships? So you guys both talked about already having trusting relationships with some of the partners. So for teams that are or people who are listening today, what does that really look like? What, what do you do when someone sends you an email and says, I want to be part of your coalition or you reach out to them? What do you actually do? Are there public facing pieces to this? Is it about using people's networks that you already have? How, you know, what's the intentional work that happens at the very front of this to get your coalition together? Yeah, so among the core, what ended up being our core partners, um, you know, we had, again, a, a deep existing relationship. So we actually sat together in a room and discussed, is this something we want to do? do? Can we all align around a single mission to put forth a proposal that we can all authentically work toward together? And do we have the resources to sort to, to sort of start to build this? Um, and then as we knew, you know, we kind of looked at what our gaps were among that very core set of partners and said, okay, what do we need to bring to, to the table to fill those gaps? Um, and so that was really largely building off of network. So um, bringing our uh, PI team to the table from NC State and other research partners um, through our existing research networks, and then bringing our economic development partners to the table through existing relationships and, and having... Um, good conversations about what the focus is, where the boundaries were, because they, you know, everybody has a home institution, everybody has other work that they're doing. And so, you know, what do we set aside for the work of the engine and be respectful of the external work that will happen that may contribute to the engine, but isn't specifically a part of it and making sure everyone felt comfortable with those things so that it wasn't a constant discussion as we build out the proposal. We kind of knew where some boundaries were, what everybody wanted to bring to the table to contribute. Um, and then, you know, understanding those resources that were available and how they were available for the engine. Great, thanks. Pear, do you wanna add to that? You know, did you guys have strategic planning meetings? Did you do one-on-one -on -one sessions with people? Did you go to events and try to introduce yourself to people? What was the real, the, the hardcore work of building those, those relationships? Yes, yeah, so we did a little bit of everything. So as I said, we kind of had a little bit of a flying start from the BBBRC. And at that time, we um, had uh, bigger meetings that was not just getting the coalition together and the partners, but also for the community to build that community stakeholder engagement and literally explain what we're doing to the community and also show that you know the, the coalition then had to work together in order to present that to the community. So that's something that I think was really, really valuable when we put the initial coalition together and we built on that when we did the engines, we already had a meeting like that sort of as part of winning the BBBRC when we started the engine works, we sort of weave that in. And I wish our plan was to do more of that when we put the engine together, but we ran out of time. So, you know, things like that takes a lot of time, but it has a lot of value because the community very often do not understand what something like this is and particularly NSF and particularly something like engine and research, uh, at least a little bit more communities like we have upstate New York, um, it's a little bit harder to get people on the on the street sort of engage and understand and see the importance and value of that. So I think that's very important. Now that's I feel like we missed out a little bit on that. But when it came to the planning of the engine itself, uh, a lot of one-on-ones, 
because you have to make sure that you build that relationship individually with each organization that you're going to work with. And that's incredibly important that that happens between the lead and the partner early on. Uh, but also weekly meetings with all important people at the different institutions, organizations to describe what you're doing, how you're doing it, how you're distributing. Uh, so every week, getting people together to do that. And and that's tough because there's uh, you get some proposal fatigue at some point where people get a little bit of tired, you know, and I'll be doing this again. And then you have, of course, here a lot of very, very important and busy people that you want to engage because you need that kind of people on the call for planning purposes and buy-in at the institution. So it's very, very hard to find the time. So you sort of need to set that time very, very early and set it so that everyone should or have to at some point, at least, even if they're busy in the beginning, they will have time to participate. Very often those meetings end up at very inconvenient times, like 7 or 8 a.m. in the morning, because that's the only available time people have. But I think that's so stuff like that is just critically important in order to build that consensus for putting this together. So the more you do, the better it is. It's just it takes so much time and you're so busy with so many things when you're putting this together. I still think it's one of the key things that you have to do to make sure that you really talk a lot, you know, and have that discussions a lot. Even sometimes when you feel like, well, I didn't necessarily resolve anything today because people go on in all kinds of different tangents. I think it's really, really important to try to do that. And, uh, you know, when you do that, Yes, you know, people will start talking about all, all kind of things that is maybe peripheral, but that's part of the team building. And then, of course, you need to manage the meeting so that you get try to get something productive or something concluded from each of those meetings. But that's that's kind of what we did. I, I felt like it worked well. I wish we had done even more, actually, because the more you build a very clear consensus of what you're going to do when you win this grant and you're all going to win it, uh, the easier it is to also kick off the work when you when you kick off the work. Fantastic. Melissa, anything that Pear said that you want to follow up on? Yeah, I think the the I think a big takeaway is that authenticity of the partnership and and that ability to build the team and work together because it as I said before, it is a really long process. And I know lots of us were up at one o'clock on the phone with each other writing proposal pieces and you know, you really have to have the right kind of rapport to work through that level of pressure and work. And of course, once you get to the site visit stage uh, gates of the process, like that adds additional pressure. And so having a really solid relationships in place for the team that's going to be leading the proposal writing and the site visits um, is is hugely important. And it, as Pear mentioned, it does kind of really help you on that initial startup phase where there's a lot of time pressure and, and kind of a lot of activities and things happening all at once to get started. And so um, I, I would just really encourage folks to think about as you're building out your teams and, and that core leadership team of the proposal process that, um, you know, you have solidly built relationships and you're not just bringing people in because they have something you need, like you want to build that authentically. Perfect. You just gave me the runway to the next question. So how did you, Melissa, decide on the lead organization? And how did the decision about the lead organization relate to the choices about the region of service? So how, yeah. how do you think about those as key pieces? Uh, it was hugely important for us. So we are textile focused. Um, so one of the first things that we did was look at what counties um, in our sort of larger geographic region had the highest concentration of textile employment and textile establishments, um, which helped us think about where we could have the most impact as part of our region of service. Uh, and that leaned largely from the Piedmont of uh, North Carolina to the west and then sort of uh, some of upstate South Carolina and a few other counties and surrounding states. Um, and so that really pushed us to think, you know, I'm, my home institution is NC State University. And so that really pushes us to think, you know, NC State has this fantastic infrastructure to support a program like this. But does it really make sense for us as, to be the lead institution when it's largely focused to the western parts of North Carolina, which are, you know, a little bit distant from us? And then, of course, with the focus of the engines program really being about investing in places that have been, you know, have lacked this innovation investment from the seat of Raleigh, does that make the most sense? And so we had this really fantastic relationship with industrial commons. Um, and so we had a really great uh, conversation with them about like, the, we think this is really important for our industry. We think this could bring a, a you know, a really uh, amazing opportunity to 
take national uh, textiles onto a national stage, uh, help an industry that's been poorly invested in from an innovation standpoint um, at the federal level for a really long time and give us an opportunity to really advance things for our industry. And because of the way textiles um, are made, the manufacturing facilities fit really well in rural communities. And so we felt like it was just sort of this nexus of good fit of all of these different parts and pieces. And so uh, having Industrial Commons be an amazing partner that was community focused, had deep ties of um, equity and uh, representing um, interest for things like opportunity youth and other uh, important aspects of some of the non-innovation parts of the engine. Uh, felt like a really great fit as well. Um, and so that was how we sort of landed with Industrial Commons and then saying like NC State is here with all of this infrastructure to support because they've never had a program of this scope and scale at Industrial Commons. So I think the combination of those two things together was a really powerful way for us to approach building the, the core team. And then we added our community college partners sort of around that as well as some of our other um, partners that are bringing some additional resources um, to the table. Great, thanks. And we have a nice contrast here with Pear's project that's based at a university. So tell us a little bit about your decision about the lead organization, the region of service, and maybe, um, you know, Melissa was talking about this, uh, this nexus between the university infrastructure and the trust that a local organization has in the region. So can you also give us some some of that and how that works in the Binghamton region? Yeah, and I think that trust there is what kind of was the key because we already had put this coalition together and had started to execute and done that in a way that I think gave us that trust from the community and the partners. Um, was what made it sort of natural that we stayed on as the lead for the engine. It didn't have to be that way. We did think about it. One of our partners that we brought in for the engine is Cornell, and Cornell is 10 times bigger than, than Binghamton Research Expenditures. You can easily argue that why shouldn't they lead this when they're so uh, much bigger in research? Uh, but we felt that, and no one questioned that, uh, which I probably shouldn't say surprised me, but maybe it surprised me a little bit that no one did question us on that. Uh, that we just kept that leadership that we already had in this space. And of course, it's really tied to the area we're working in too, the battery space, right? It made a lot of sense because of the assets we have, the people we have and what's going on here already as part of that, that we also kept leading that. Um, so I don't, we, we didn't really give our other partners a choice, I think. I think we never set that up as a democratic decision. You know, let's vote who's going to be the lead. We uh, we put this together, we reached out to everyone. Of course, we had a lot of partners also coming to us, but it was really our initiative to put together and lead and assemble. And no one really came and questioned that. Uh, but when it came to this regional service, I think that's probably the area we spent more time discussing than anything else. You know, what should you include? How far? How big? Uh, how does that affect, you know, the populations, the demographics, the institution assets? The companies in the region, the jobs, everything. So that's a tough question. And we went back and forth and we did never fully agree, I think, as a coalition exactly, did we do it exactly right or not? I think I think we did. I, I'm happy with what we did, but it's very, very tough to decide. Um, and, you know, we still have these situations where we wish sometimes, oh, I wish we could have extended a little bit more. Um, but of course, the, you know, we want we want impact in the region as much as possible, but of course we work across the nation too. So we have partnerships all across the nation too. Um, but that's that's a tough one, you know, because it has to align with what you're doing, where things are, assets, people, jobs, research, et cetera, et cetera. So we felt that um, a university is a good place for an initiative like this because use inspired research and translation is something that universities today do a lot. So we think it was well placed. Uh, but I also see big advantages for not having it at the university too, sort of having a more like a neutral uh, third party to lead it and put people together and organizations together. I see a lot of value in that too. So I, I'm not going to say that it should be a university at all, but you know, for us, it seemed to be natural, just also based on the partners we had, I think. You know, it depends so much on what that coalition, that, yeah, what kind of partners do you have? You know, what really just have to think about what makes sense for the partners you have, the region you have, and the assets you have, and what you're doing, I think, what makes sense. So, Per, can I pick up on a detail that you just mentioned? So, 
you're at a big university. It has its own str strategic plan. It has its own leadership. So how do you understand your role as the CEO slash PI within a larger university structure? How, how do you negotiate that relationship? Or, and what are some things that teams should think about when they start putting this together relative to that particular um, aspect of what you're doing? Yeah, that is actually a very good question. And it is challenging because universities are inherently selfish. They want to have the money themselves and the research and everything. And that's not the purpose here, right? You have a coalition and a, an initiative that spans across multiple organizations and regions where outside of where the university typically will have their reach. And as a CEO, I feel like that's absolutely critical to keep that sort of neutrality. So I work for an institution, but I have to be neutral and make sure that the benefits uh, spans not just the core partners, but really the whole region and the people that this is supposed to benefit. And uh, that doesn't always align 100% with what the university would like to see. Uh, often they would like to see as much research expenditure as possible and et cetera, et cetera. So it's, um, it's inherently something that you have to try to, the more you can establish that upfront when you apply, the better it is. Uh, and then, of course, it will boil down to a lot what the governance looks like and that everyone buys into what that governance structure should look like. And I'm going to fully admit that we spent a lot of time on that. That's something that came out on the, the site visit in particular, where we were pushed very, very much from NSF to think about, do we have the right governance structure? Will it cover every scenario that can come up? And, you know, we worked a lot on that, actually, in order to come up with what we currently have. And now we're uh, hoping to execute that and make sure that that serves our purpose. Great. So I'm going to use that as a setup again for Melissa. So because you just mentioned that NSF really pushed hard at the site visit on the governance question. So thinking about that, that as the proposal writing uh, is happening, there's these different gates and different steps. Can you give us, Melissa, an example of a problem that emerged early on when you were writing your proposal and how the team was able to overcome that problem and keep moving forward? Like, it, did you hit any little bumps along the way? I think for us, um, you know, we've had challenges going after big proposals for textiles collectively. And I think there was a lot of doubt that this was maybe worth the effort because there was a lot of doubt that this could. Um, you know, reach the stage of award for a textile based proposal. So we got a lot of pressure to, you know, maybe couch our topic area in other ways. Um, and I think that's, again, that goes back to, you know, having the strong partnerships among those who are leading the, the proposal writing and sort of making these initial decisions about the strategies and the, the direction of your research and the direction of your other activities. Um, because we felt really strongly that our story fit the um, proposal language. And so and that gave us a lot of confidence. Um, and that that being said, though, our team that actually led and wrote this proposal was really green in terms of writing proposals at this level and scope. Um, and so that was another challenge. So we had to do a lot of legwork convincing, say, our like here at NC State, our proposal development unit, even though NC State wasn't the lead, eventually came on to help us write this proposal and give us some guidance because um, you know, there were three of us really who spent the most time actually building the proposal and kind of downloading other people's brains to put those into the activities and strategies of the engine. And so getting feedback is incredibly important because that really helped us, especially because this wasn't something we felt like we, you know, had done a hundred times and been very successful at, um, you know, so really, you know, being humble and asking for help, asking for feedback, asking for people to sit with you and talk with you about you know, their experiences in writing these types of proposals um, was really, really incredibly helpful um, for us. Just, I think there were times that we were like, we don't even know how to start because I've never done anything like this before. And, um, and so just really understanding that like, it's, it's great to ask for help and to build something of this scale and scope. No one person is going to have all the answers. This is a really large program and it's new for NSF. It's new for the teams that won. And so, there is no, there, there shouldn't really be any pride that stops you from saying, hey, I'm not really sure how to approach this. And even when we had the opportunity to engage with the NSF uh, program managers that sort of helped the teams along the way in the proposal development to really just be okay to ask questions to say, like, we're not sure we fully understand what's happening here. I think that was, we didn't really hit any like major snags or hiccups or problems per se, but it was really in getting to the point that people had confidence in what we were doing and then 
you know, building confidence within ourselves to, to move through the proposal process. And, you know, I think along the way, we kept calling it the little engine that could, because we were all sort of, every time we got the next to the next stage, we were all just so excited and, and uh, like a little surprised at every stage. So that was, it was uh, just part of our process. Great, thanks. And I want to take a chance to remind everyone that you can start sending us questions for the guests. You can do it in the Q&A function, or if it's not working, you can put them into the main chat. Um, so, Per, um, what about you guys? Did you have any problems that emerged? Did you have to hit any bumps and kind of go over the bumps or any other thoughts about uh, the struggle to actually get this all together? There were quite a few bumps, some I'm happy to talk about and some I'm not happy to talk about, you know, things that happen that uh, you just don't understand why it happens, but they happen and you resolve them. So that's that's going to happen. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, other than that, we had we had a few. So one of the things that we decided is that, you know, this is huge. Uh, we have written large proposals before, um, but this, this is an enormous proposal, uh, complicated partners. So we uh, did hire a grant writer firm, a big firm to help out. That did not work out. And when you do that and it doesn't work out, it's much worse than not hiring a grant writing firm, I can tell you, because you end up with things not getting done and you have to do stuff and the timeline is suddenly all completely messed up. So uh, be careful. Uh, if you're going to have a grant writer, you know, we, I haven't been able to, we, we submit a lot of grants and we win quite a few grants and haven't found the right way to work with grant writers. So just, just to, you know, the fact that you get the big firm on board doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to, um, help you as much as you think. So just be careful there. Um, other problems is that um, you, you have a tendency when you write stuff like this to focus on what you know, what you're good at. And for example, in our case, we're good at research. Obviously we're in a research institution. We're pretty good at translation. Uh, we're not as good at the workforce development. That's not the strong suit for universities in general. Uh, so the tendency could be that you focus on those things that you're good at and take those first. And then suddenly you run out of time in order to address some of those other issues that you probably should have started with because you need more time to figure out how to do it and engage more partners. So um, always a little bit of panic at the end when you realize that some of the things you have postponed because they were harder, suddenly is really hard and you have to figure out how to do it. So, um, you know, sometimes you don't understand how you get things actually submitted, but uh, there's always a way. If there's a will, there is a way to get it in somehow. So, yeah. Great. Okay, so now you guys are award recipients. You're getting bombarded with requests for information, people who want to know about the project, who want to partner. Um, we'll start with you, Pear. When somebody comes to you and says, we want to join your project, what do you, con from the engine side, what do you consider in bringing on a new partner or an opportunity that presents itself? You know, what what do you, do you meet the group? Do you try to talk something through? Do you have a kind of vetting process? Is it handled from you as the CEO or more you know, broadly in the team? Can you just talk a little bit about that? Because now that you have the funds, I know you, you just get a lot of people showing up. So, so what is the process to not overwhelm the team with these requests? Yes, we get a lot of requests, but very, and we, we contact everyone. So we talk to everyone that comes to us, try to vet them a little bit, look at what they're doing, look at fit. Um, but in not a tremendous amount of those uh, sort of align directly with the engine very often, there's always something. So there hasn't been a lot of onboarding on new uh, members yet. Um, we did quite a bit actually before the site visit, just because it, um, it was partners that we wanted to have on board from the start. We just never had time. You never have time to reach out to everyone and talk to everyone that you really should. So we definitely had some holes. So we did do that up until the site visit more. That was very, very successful and extremely happy about what we how we did that. And now we kind of took a little bit of a step back and say, okay, what is the structure we're going to have going forward? You know, are we, um, I don't want to just take as you said, you know, right now there is sort of funding on the table, right, for someone. So yeah, that's why a lot of companies come to us. And um, we have to be sort of want to make sure that the fit is there and there's a commitment there. And that's sort of the key. So we're taking a little bit of a step back and say, we need to work out the process for how we do this and what kind of commitment that we want a new partner to give us uh, before coming in. And to date, we had partners come in and they submitting commitments, but they're not really commitments, right? So um, Kind of um, 
working on that a little bit to see, you know, what should the process be and what kind of commitment should we make sure we have before we onboard them. But in general, we would like to onboard everyone if we can, but it has to be a commitment there and we haven't kind of worked all that out yet. Great, thanks. Melissa, what about you guys? Yeah, I think this, this is something we're still actually working through a bit is defining what is, you know, like what is a partner look like versus a member of the organization um, sort of being someone either who brings a, something to the table in terms of resources or is a beneficiary of some of the funds that we have for our open call process, for instance. Um, and so I think really defining what you are going to call a partner versus what can just be a member of the of the or engine, I think that is uh, important work to do. And so for us, uh, kind of to Pear's point, we're not really onboarding new partners, but we are starting to onboard members who will have access to some of the engine resources. Um, and in that part, in that case, what we are really sort of taking is a big tent approach to membership because we want to build up the energy and the coalition and, and uh, help everyone see that hopefully there is um, a place for them in the engine and some benefit for them to participating in our engine activities um, over these first two years uh, because we didn't have a Build Back Better or an EDA Tech Hub grant to kind of get us started. We're still in that more nascent phase of our engine of building all the administrative pieces. And, and so what we want to show is the value um, to the people who are potential future partners as we, you know, maybe hopefully have access to more funds in the future and we have uh, more resources to share. Um, and as we bring additional financial, um, you know, contributions in from other um, stakeholders. So I think, you know, setting those uh, boundaries up between what are partners, what are members, you know, who's going to be sort of more loosely affiliated, those sorts of things are are important. Um, the other sort of overwhelming thing more so than partners has been requests to speak. And I think that is where having, um, you know, the mindset of some shared leadership where you have a, a multiple people who you feel comfortable um, to give overviews and, and be able to speak about the engine who are part of your core partners, um, I think is really important. So we've sort of established within our engine what we call our speakers bureau. And then we all vet any kind of speaking requests centrally before we send people out because Sometimes it's, you know, asking us from North Carolina to go out to California and speak for, you know, an hour and that, you know, you have to start doing the calculus of is that worth, you know, our time and effort? Can we do it by Zoom or can we just send you um, like a one page flyer? So trying to find some resources to um, reduce the burden. So I was really excited we were recording this today because I think this will answer a lot of people's questions too over the, the course of the road shows. Awesome. Thank you. So, Pear, I want to ask you about the role of government in your proposal. New York State made a commitment to um, support an engine that was given an award um, or earned an award. So can you say a little bit about your local government, state government, regional government partners, and how, as a team, you thought about the, the government side of the partnerships? Yeah, and, and this goes actually back a little bit to the BBRC because there we had to have the local government as a partner. So, you know, we already worked that angle quite a bit going into the engine. So we already had that relationship established. And, you know, the New York State didn't give an award to us because we asked them, they made a commitment to a proposal like this that if there are winners in the state, we will make a commitment uh, of a certain amount to the engine that wins. And uh, so it wasn't us going and lobbying and say that, you know, we, you should only support us and, and no one else. This was sort of something that they did. But support from New York State has been, in everything we do, it's been very, very, very crucial. Um, I don't think, and it, it was kind of interesting in this case because the, the state also does things differently depending on what it is. And in this case, they had one way of doing it. Sometimes they have other ways of doing it, but the support from the team there has been tremendous. So I can't do anything but just commend them on, on what they did and how they support it. So not sure what else to say there, but uh, we, we, we do work with the, the regional government, the local government a lot. You know, if they think that's absolutely critical to make this happen. Um, we do updates with them on a regular basis. We just had that a couple of weeks ago to do an update to make sure that everyone understand what we're doing. Um, and I think that's critically important too, to have that buy-in and do that advocacy for the work you're doing. Fantastic. Uh, Melissa, what about you? Are you guys in that much contact with uh, state and local government? 
Yes, yeah, so for us, we um, didn't go for state funding prior to our proposal. Um, and so in North Carolina works a little differently than some of the other states because they um, are a little bit more conservative in how they provide matching funds for things. But um, we do have a person on our leadership team as one of the core partners from the North Carolina Department of Commerce, as well as advisors from the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality, which we felt was really important. Um, our Department of Commerce has some programs that will be beneficial to members of the engine for commercialization funds and startup funds for companies. Um, so they bring a great some great resources to the table. And of course, Department of Envi Environmental Quality, as we start to think about policies, uh, regulatory affairs, things like that around this concept of circularity and sustainability, we wanted to make sure that we had a pathway to them for um, their input, their buy-in, as well as helping to craft, you know, policy statements and things like that. So that was really important. Um, also, North Carolina has two engines, so that was really exciting for us. But um, I think one of the things that we're currently doing is discussing ways for us as a pair of engines to go after in-state funding for some of the uh, programs that we both think could benefit from that type of funding. And that way we're not competing with each other, which I think is really important. We want to make sure that we're presenting you know, a united sort of engines representation to our state um, to, to garner support. Great. So, um, Pear, what should an individual considering being PI or CEO think about in terms of the time commitment, the skill set, and what other factors do you want to take into consideration? Um, this might be a faculty member who's thinking about it, an administrator, or somebody with a full-time job in another capacity. So mm -hmm. in making the shift to full-time PI, PI CEO, can you just give some reflections on what's required and the pros and cons of making that shift? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Um, yeah, I mean, it's um, if you're going to do it right, it's uh, an enormous amount of work for sure. And to balance that with at least in that transition from your uh, existing full time job and what you're doing, while you also start an engine, it's um, it's challenging to say at the least. Um, I think the qualities you should look for is that um, neutrality, impartiality, to, so you can build that trust with all your partners because the trust there is absolutely essential, I think. Um, if you don't have that and the partners trust each other, that things are gonna be done in a partial and a neutral in a way that benefits everyone, uh, you're gonna get, I think you, we have not, we have very good partnership, but I think you very easily could spend most of your time just uh, negotiating between the partners. So I think that's absolutely, absolutely key. Uh, I think also it's good to have that ha sort of mix of uh, being able to do some hands-on, but of course you have to be able to delegate most of this because there's so much that needs to be done now. It's, uh, it's a big, um, we have a long list of things from NSF that needs to be submitted with strong, with, with timelines and dates and and um, there's a lot of a lot of things going into starting this if you win it. So uh, delegating, make sure you have a very strong team is absolutely critical. The, and it's recruiting that team when you win is hard. So the more you have that established when you start the engine, it's going to make it so much easier than saying that, oh, I'm going to win this engine and now I'm going to recruit everyone that's going to participate or, or do the work. So the more you can establish that and have candidates in mind or people on board already to do that, I think, um, going to make it successful. I mean, it's it's really all about the team, I think, for sure. It's not really, I'm not sure how much it is about the, the CEO really, but being being the one, being someone that other organizations feel they can trust, I think is absolutely the key here. Great. And Melissa, you guys are in a little different situation. So you're the deputy CEO. You also are still a faculty member, I think, at NC State or affiliated. And you guys are in the process of hiring a CEO. So to Pear's point, you know, you your situation, the setup is different. So can you tell us a little bit about that and how you as a faculty member, for example, are able to find time to do all the work related to the engine and what kind of uh, requirements your university and you put in place to manage that load? 
Yeah, I think one of the things that's really important when we sort of decided on the structure of um, having uh, two deputy CEOs and then a lead CEO and sort of that making up a, a sort of three legs of a, a C-suite, if you will, um, where we could each lead one of the pillars really well based on our home institution and our experience. Um, it, it is a different way to approach it. Um, I think we felt really strongly that um, like Molly, who is our other deputy CEO and I weren't in a position to step into the CEO role fully. And so um, just because of other commitments, uh, so I'm not a faculty member yet, but I am working on my PhD and that would, I think, be very hard to balance a job, a PhD um, process and, and being a CEO. And I think Molly, it felt very similar with where she's at in, uh, in at industrial commons. And so uh, we sort of landed on this concept because we do also don't want to step away. We've spent a long time on this proposal. We love the vision and strategies that we've set about and want to maintain a really tight connection to that. So um, that was sort of how we landed on this structure. We are searching for a CEO, hopefully onboarding one by the end of the month. We've started the interview process for that. And so, again, it, that it, it's about team building within that team to make sure that you have good communication. Um, so that you can uh, rely on each other to fill in gaps. There's days where I get busy with other things. And so I know Molly's there. And when we have the CEO on board, you know, being able to share those responsibilities. Um, for my time commitment, I um, am 50% committed to the engine. And so uh, it took a little time to clear my plate enough to actually be 50% <laughs> available for the engine inside my workday. Um, and so I think you know, understanding to some extent that I needed to do a bit of a sprint there and just take on some extra hours, which was, you know, something I was willing to do because I felt strongly uh, while working with my department head and our dean um, to um, scope out what support I needed to be able to make that space in my day. And so some of that comes through other grant programs, being able to uh, use some of my salary that was covered, to, you know, but is now on the engine to hire an additional personnel to support that activity. So it it means that, uh, you know, I had to go to them and say, look, what can we do? What can we shape? How can we reshape some of these budgets and, and sit together and figure that out? And, you know, thankfully they were very on board with this um, concept. And so they worked with me really well to do that. So I, I have those conversations early um, and thinking about what, what the roles will be and how much time is needed from the different personnel so that you can start to craft that uh, and have a plan in place even before the award happens, uh, because there is just a lot of initial like, wow, at the beginning of the announcement and trying to get everything in place. And so not having a plan, you know, puts you three to six months out before you can execute. Wonderful. And you guys have any closing thoughts? We're already here at the end of our chat. So any, any last things we didn't ask you about that you want to add? Um, I think I, I would just say from our perspective, you know, we had a topic area that a lot of people felt like wasn't going to be uh, exciting enough for a proposal like this. We had some green folks on the team, our leadership organization, our lead organization hadn't done a proposal of this, but we were able to be successful in building all this. So I think understanding that there's a place for a lot of different types of uh, engines cohorts, I think is really important to say that there's a place at the table for all sorts of things here. And that's one of the things that really excited us about this proposal. Great. And Pear? Yeah, you know, it's it's such an amazing opportunity. It's um, the key is just to focus on something that makes sense for you and your coalition and your region and what you have. And if you do that, it's so much fun to actually put together something like this and think about what could this become? What can you do if you win this? How could this actually impact uh, where you are in some tangible way at some point, which makes it really rewarding to work on, I think. Um, and so th that's the, you know, that's, that's it. I mean, figure out, make sure that what you're doing. And I've seen that too. You know, I, you probably all of you too, we were part of multiple engine applications, you know, some type ones and some type twos. And that by itself actually is, is uh, challenging actually, because your partners are also working on other applications. So that could be something you're struggling with. Um, but I also seen some attempts that sometimes you feel like that doesn't make sense. You know what they're doing and how can you then, because you have to put in 200% in order to make this happen. I mean, it's, it's such an enormous amount of work to put together. So you have to also feel like this really makes sense. This makes sense. If I can just put this together the way it should be, 
I should have a, a, a chance of winning this because it makes sense. So that, that's kind of what you have to figure out to make sure that you do something that you really are passionate about because it makes sense with what you have in R and your region and, and your partners. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So I just want to thank you guys so much for spending time with us and giving us such great answers.